Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the six o'clock conversation um, on the film works of Lawrence Wiener, um, which is meant to be a little warm up for the presentation of Lawrence Wiener's film later on tonight at the um, uh, cinema here, uh, Kunst uh, im Kino. Um, just behind the Kunsthalle. The film will be Dirty Eyes from Lawrence Wiener, produced um, late, late in the last year and uh, premiered this year uh, at uh, the Ber uh, Berlinale Film Festival. Um, we wanted to have a short talk here together with Gregor Stemmrich. Uh, I'm very happy that he had the chance to come. Uh, professor Stemmerich, so he, he studied uh, art, art history and philosophy and as professor for art history at the Free University in Berlin and his publications reach from uh, a minimal art, a critical retrospective to books on Jeff Wall, Dan Graham, uh, a book on uh, cinema and art or Kunstkino and of course uh, maybe the most important one for tonight as well is having been said, writings and interviews of Lawrence Wiener. Uh, this is the German version of the book and it's also of course available in English. And so we thought it would be really a good point to start maybe to talk about uh, Lawrence's films um, and about the history of his film making uh, over the years. Um, so maybe as a kind of starting point, tracing back or talking about the films of, of Lawrence uh, means tracing back to the really early years. Not the really early years, like the first, I would say, in the 60s works, but um, to the early 70s. And I found it quite interesting that um, he, he, when he started to really do films uh, yeah. and to shift to this medium, um, in the relation to what he has been doing before, what would you say? Like, w that there seems to be this, this key moment in yeah. uh, producing art and producing film and art at that moment in America. And how would you relate that to the other works that had been done before? It's rather complex. One has to see that he started in the early sixties, mid sixties with painting and sculpture. And then using this experience to go on to the use of language. Language as material in reference to material which he still thinks is basically sculpture. And he's very interested in the relationship of human beings to objects, to materials, the relationship of materials to materials. But he's also thinking that his art has meaning or can gain meaning within interpersonal relationships. Within his art, language in mm -hmm. relation to material, he's not able to deal with that. And film and video give him that access to create a mise-en-scene, a situation mm -hmm. for the presentation of such interrelational possible meanings of his works. Mm -hmm. And that was very important. And he was not the only artist who was inter interested at that time, early 70s, in the use of film. But when we think, we had two avant-garde. Mid 70s, this article of uh, Peter, Peter Warren, Peter Warren yeah. came out, the two avant-garde in filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Meaning there's an avant-garde, let's say, of Eisenstein to Godard. Mm -hmm. And there's experimental film working done by artists or filmmakers very close to the art world. And this model, we have two avant-gardes, which is weird enough, didn't work anymore. Artists like David Lamelas, Yvonne Rayner, and um, Lawrence Wiener, all in 1973 started to make large feature films. Mm -hmm. Not in the Hollywood sense of a feature film, but in their own sense what they wanted to do with it. They mm -hmm. wanted to relate to Hollywood. All of these. It was clearly a reference point, but not with the intention to enter the Hollywood scene. That's the point. That's not at all. But they want to have another relationship of art to the culture mm -hmm. in a way that was, we have this in the 90s, or the video installation work that is dealing with Hollywood. That was another, another time. The, the means were different. But... Uh, also, the aim was, we would say, like nowadays, the aim might also be different. That art, like artists, actually aim for Hollywood, <laughs> so well, wanting to be a, in this scene. In the late 70s, early 80s, a lot of artists, uh, Robert Longo, uh, Cindy Sherman, and others, really went to Hollywood and got commissions there and did movies. Warhol tried this, but let's go back to Godard. Godard was a real influence for mm -hmm. Wiener, 
he hold, holds him in highest esteem at that time. Think, also for Ivan Rain and other artists, they knew exactly what he was doing and what kind of uh, effect this had on the whole culture. Mm -hmm. And this was a role model in a, in a sense, more than Andy Warhol, I would say, mm -hmm. which connects uh, Hollywood mimicry with underground cinema and inventing the superstar. Then uh, uh, Lawrence Wiener is not mm -hmm. interested in a superstar system, neither uh, mm -hmm. David Lamilos or any of these artists that changed the format of filmmaking done by artists from experimental structural filmmaking mm -hmm. and so on to this other kind of uh, format. And what's very important, the first film had the title A First Quarter. First quarter yeah. And quarter implies the four quarters were planned. Mm -hmm. And he realized two or three years later a second quarter. And yeah. what is meant by this is, a, is an idea of a set. Mm -hmm. And each of these films uh, was related to a cultural ambience. Mm -hmm. The first quarter was related to New York. Mm -hmm. Very much New York ambience. The second quarter, he, Lawrence Wiener had a DAAD um, mm -hmm. grant, was done in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Totally different atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And this kind of relationship to his, of his art to the, uh, to the culture at large, but, but a specific place, a specific kind of culture, cultural history, mm -hmm. Berlin is very histo historically loaded, was very important for him. And there's another point. It's a situation outside the art world. It's not bound to the notion of the art world, what's what is important in the art world, what is mm -hmm. not important, and so on. And this is quite different from his videographic work, which started in 19, uh, 1970. Mm -hmm. The early videographic pieces, he, Leo Castelli had a video camera, and he did very easy pieces using uh, early works of his, like two and four, four and two, and mm -hmm. two and four, and mm -hmm. four and two. Somebody, one only sees a hand, is doing this on a mm -hmm. table. It's a kind of advertisement for his own work, how it could be seen, how it could be realized, how it could be visualized. So it's directed uh, towards the filmmaking as a kind of process, or like for the, the video making, the actually? The art world. There's the art, there yeah. is a camera of the galleries, there is a mm -hmm. kind of advertisement, mm -hmm. and so on. It's changed very qu quickly, but I would say, generally, there is a closer relationship between his videographic work to the art context. There are often art talk situations, people talk about mm -hmm. art, and at the same time he starts to, to take up cultural pretexts, like pretexts that are bound up with television or with mm -hmm. video, mm -hmm. like video pornography mm -hmm. or soap opera or television advertisements and so on. All these models were taken in into this kind of videographic work Mm -hmm. and became another kind of focus, quite distinct from mm -hmm. his filmic work, which developed throughout the 70s and then later on until now. So and you could say that it's like, while like with video, he's like, you said it, I think, was, uh, was more focused, uh, had a centripetal yeah. dynamics towards the art world itself. The, the film has the tendency to reach beyond and like I the would say centrifugal so. dynamics almost. It's really that way and it goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. in opposite directions, and uh, both models are related to the broader cultural context. What I say in relation to, to video, it's mm -hmm. video. A video can easily be presented on a monitor in a gallery space. Mm -hmm. That's not the same with this film. He's not interested in film installation work, uh, installation work but presenting film in theaters mm -hmm. in a certain situation, closed off in a certain way from the art world. Uh, you have but, but, it, but it's also the intention with doing film, for instance, also leaving the regular set of the museum. That's, That's what like, I, I think, where he says, yeah. and one of, I was, uh, as, as I reminded clearly, that it's in one of his commentaries on, specifically on the first quarter, he's, he's saying it's not um, uh, what, uh, what is art, but it's where is art. Like this, this shift is also yeah. this, to have this focus on clearly what is the setup to do this in, a, in another space. Yeah. So this is kind of, and that, that's something that he also addresses then in a, in a lot of his, his written writings then later yeah. on, of course, yeah. the question of like where actually is it happening and what is, the, what is the dynamics that comes out of this shift, like putting this not here, yeah. but there. It's a very important question from him, for him. Where does not only mean where is it presented, but where is the meaning of the work? And this kind of 
notion of interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. His work, the work I just mentioned in relation to video, two and four, four and two, and two and four, and four and two, is used as a device in uh, first quarter. Mm -hmm. But there a woman is doing something on the chest of a man. And so it's another kind of interpersonal relationship that is not present in the video graphic work from 1970. Mm -hmm. So these kinds of distinctions are very important. And video is much more graphic. Mm -hmm. It's uh, drawing in a certain way. It's shadow, but it's flat, more mm -hmm. flat than mm -hmm. a filmic image. And he's very aware of these differences. And in an interview, he said he sees film like sculpture. Okay. It's yeah. cut material. Mm -hmm. And this kind of cutting or editing mm -hmm. is very close in the beginning to Godard. Because there is no continuous narrative, but everything mm -hmm. is sort of fragmented. Uh, people can identify to a certain point with a mm -hmm. character or mm -hmm. a face. It's not no character is developed like in a Hollywood movie. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have a kind of need to identify with a certain person and then you get interrupted somehow other mm -hmm. scenes or repetition of scenes with other other soundtrack or other uh, written or uh, he, I mean also in the later works he's following up on that and I, I always kept that in mind uh, also coming of course like from a film studies background for me it was interesting to to have this correlation between this uh, this con this or this continuity in this Godard interest that the yeah. e even in the later films is is there and you have always this aspect of two dimensions of the narrative almost like that you have this as you say like another uh, one one sequence and another sequence and yeah. and and I, th I think he describes it like that almost and 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 this and this and yeah. this and this like to see them like you know as a kind of sequence cut one after the other yeah. while the cuts are actually the ones that all of a sudden yeah. go to the forefront apart from the scenes yeah. there's all uh, uh, because of this like like un unleashing this kind of tight knots of n the narrative, yeah. all of a sudden a certain um, uh, approach to a more like structural di dimension of the whole thing, seeing the image as the image, seeing the face as the face, yeah. or like you know seeing the different um, the different aspects that are in the actual film that and how they are combined as as objects almost. The term structure is very precise because that's a term he's using all the time. When he makes a video, he says it's a structure, mm. or a film, and even a book, it's a structure. Um, because there are certain elements, you see them as elements, and you relate them, or see how he or somebody related them. But the activity of the receiver is also part of the game, because you can't avoid relating things in a certain way, and at the same time being aware that you are the one who makes decisions. Some things go so fast, you have to make a decision where to look and how to connect or uh, how to take up the written language in the image or the spoken language or the, what the people are doing. Mm -hmm. If they execute, if they fabricate a work mm -hmm. of his, so that relates to language, to written language and to interpersonal relationship. And it's very important to know, otherwise you would have a complete misunderstanding of his films. It's not about acting. He says his the people he is collaborating with are players. Mm -hmm. And you very much get the sense that he takes people out of an everyday normal context, people he has contact to, and mm -hmm. asks them, he can't give them the money. Mm -hmm. He's not so super rich that he would pay them for that. Are you prepared? Would, would it be OK for you to be a part in this kind mm -hmm. of structure I'm developing? And he had no written script. He makes drawings, mm -hmm. kind of ideas, structures, wonderful drawings. Mm -hmm sometimes a certain sentence or a work and a photograph and all kinds of elements. And he presents this to these collaborators. Mm -hmm. And they get ideas what they can do within this kind of structure that builds itself in the process. The production is as important as the presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The production is process that is not totally determined by his decisions. Mm -hmm. But the way they, the players then start to to act in in, in this in this films, it brings to mind uh, without uh, saying uh, not saying that it is Brechtian, but there is this all of a sudden this this moment that they act out and it is like continuously in the in in yeah. this in this films. It's always this irritation moment. You can't feel any kind of empathy with them. Like you know, you always yeah. stay away from them in a certain way, but you see them in the way they are. Like you know 
acting. <laughs> They play a role yeah. that's quite obvious, but in a but totally different Brechtian, way. Right? It's Brechtian, but the attitude of the people are less Brechtian mm -hmm. than in the typically yeah. Brechtian <laughs> sense. Okay. Because they are really taken out of an everyday experience, context. He knows his people and they behave like normal people, but got a task. The idea of task-like act mm -hmm. activity was very, very dominant in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It even was a term that um, even Rainer used to translate principles from minimal art mm -hmm. to dance. Milit literalness is task-like task activity. You see, they have a task, and they do it as good as they can, and there is no intent to build up a certain image of a character, a mm -hmm. self-centered figure, a protagonist who is uh, fascinating the public. You see a split. There is a person. And there is a role, and mm -hmm. the person, okay, is prepared to do this because there is this role. Yeah. So there is always a split. You have the idea: these are normal people in everyday context, mm -hmm. and these are people who play a role for the purpose. And then mm -hmm. you ask, what is the purpose? What their means to an end? What kind of end? And this is not totally clear because you are part of the process to see how it is staged in a way. Mm -hmm. It's it's not theater, but film, but it mm -hmm. is staged in a certain way, mm -hmm. and that comes close to what you say about yeah, yeah. Brecht. And then you also, like, for me, what's interesting uh, to, uh, to see how he, at a certain points, for instance, um, in the film that we will see tonight in Dirty Eyes, uh, he's using this reference momentum, for instance, uh, uh, a kind of like very small gesture that, for instance, uh, um, one actor is doing yeah. this movement, uh, a clear reference for me, like seeing that, uh, 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 remind, being reminded of Abu Zufle or Breathless fr uh, from Godard, uh, very direct uh, quote, while Godard already making this quote mm. uh, as a reference to, um, to um, Humphrey Bogart uh, or the, de the detectives, <laughs> okay. the detective film. Of course, um, and I was immediately intrigued to, to see like, oh, this is like it leads somewhere. There's all, all of a sudden this kind of clue, but like it leads to nowhere actually. Like he lets you, yeah. like you know, uh, he <laughs> keeps you in the in the air with with this reference point that leads to nowhere, while making at the same time you recognize how y how <laughs> what you bring into actually or the already th this film as a kind of pretext like you know how you are determined or by already by a certain knowledge a certain kind of history uh, that you bring with like mm -hmm. there's never a, this neutral situation which at that point brought me back to the idea well when he started of course the debate was like in at least in the film context was highly influenced by something we call the the apparatus critique is that, was that a kind of mind frame for him I don't think so much, not other artists like Dan Graham use mm -hmm. this very much. Uh, Dan Graham used it in his cinema model of 1981, but he worked over the whole time of the 70s on this kind of project. He read it all. And Lawrence Wiener once told me he tried to read this and was disappointed because all this theory was always about Hitchcock. And uh, it's, tr it's true. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> all the examples that are chosen Hitchcock. So he tried, but then became disinterested. That's not the point in my films. Mm -hmm. This kind of metapsychological film theory. But he's very aware of mm -hmm. all the implications of Hollywood and how it can relate and how he tries not to relate or make a distinction between what, between what is he, he is doing and what Hollywood is doing and what the criteria of success or quality may be for him or for Hollywood. Because mm -hmm. what I what is say about acting. Of course, acting is wonderful when it's good acting, but that's really not the point in his films. He calls them home movies, mm -hmm. and this is a category which is not so easily translatable. He uses that for all his films. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Home movies. Yeah. Do you have a German word for it? It's not the point right now, but mm -hmm. it's hard to translate. But it means you have the private means to build up a mise-en-scene a situation to color collaborate with people without incredibly much money to pay anybody and so on. It's all very cheap mm -hmm. and inexpensive. Mm -hmm. But that's not the main point. They want to do the project in order to create certain thematic focal points. Mm -hmm. One of these focal points is emigration and immigration. Mm -hmm. Some of the film, one is uh, shot in Amsterdam, uh, Altered Suit 
it's all dealing with um, immigration, immigration mm -hmm. and passage to the north also, both are mid to, uh, to late 70s. Mm -hmm. So one has to ask, what does this mean? It can be related to his work, because his work can easily emigrate from one culture to mm -hmm. the next. It's trans it is transcultural. He's saying it's not poetry. Poetry can't be easily translated. It can, one can try to make a mm -hmm. translation of a poem. But he says, my work is designed to be translated either in other languages or mm -hmm. into a material reality. Mm -hmm. It can be mm -hmm. built. And this is also always a possibility to present it within an, a different cultural context. Yeah, okay. So this kind of, what does it mean to have my work outside of the US or yeah. Western cultures and so on, is also always part of his thinking about art. But on other sides, I'm just uh, thinking uh, about the uh, film in 76, or the, the actually the video that he's doing then when he's producing uh, this yeah. series of uh, four videos one uh, being a soft porno, one being a hardcore porno, which was very specifically not like uh, or, or not about translating it into another culture, but very specifically yeah. for the for the American context, at least the one in in seventy six that he did. So as a kind of reaction to a certain kind of censorship. Yeah. Then he's well Four years ago, maybe some of you know, when he was showing, uh, was producing uh, Water and Milk Exists, which was shown here as well, uh, in a porn cinema, he was tur turning back to this kind of topic. Well, of course, under certain, completely certain diff yeah. like, you know, uh, circumstances. Um, while the situation in 76, you had the censorship, and it was clearly like a way of like showing that this is possible, that, it, that uh, using that, like, <laughs> tool of artist film like to be able to or like to overcome the censorship yeah. and showing like well this is just what was it is nothing less and nothing nothing more yeah. and um, then returning actually to this question of like maybe the, this pornographic momentum uh, four years ago which I found interesting um, while at the same time then like you know with the, the situation of the net and uh, the availab availability of porn at that moment you have a s completely different scenario even of course in the states yeah. so how would you see this 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 connection or this inter interest in this specific like of course like this body centered question like the body yeah. is generally important to him it's but but, but the qu this specific question um, i think he always rejected the term conceptual art. Mm -hmm. Everybody says, Lawrence Wiener, of course, a conceptual artist. And in one interview, he says, I have respect for what my colleagues who are conceptual artists do, but for me, uh, art relates to people, and people fuck and shit and piss, and if you close this out, it's not interesting for me. <laughs> That's not, my art relates to people who really also do this. So. This is a very aggressive point toward the cat kind of categorization mm -hmm. the art history mm -hmm. did in relation to his work. It's one, one move in this, and the other is towards a society who is totally aggressive towards this kind of, yeah, what, not only uh, pornography, but as I was told, even a painting by Hans Baldung Green showing mm -hmm. sexual parts of a body were put into the archive in a museum in Houston. Mm -hmm. It was not open for the public. That's pornographic. So this kind of uh, aggressive anti-pornographic mm -hmm. attitude was to be fought against. Mm -hmm. I think that was in the mid-70s. Mm -hmm. And now what you try to thematize is that we have now a situation on the internet. Pornography is available in huge amounts. Mm -hmm. and so. It's in a different way part of, this, uh, of a culture, but if you see these works, they are not stimulating in any way sexually, because he cuts this into pieces in a certain way, even discussing quantum mechanics in relation to a sexual act. So, and these people themselves are playing a role, and this is very clear in the situation, they play a role, and there's a distance built into that. And this is also very interesting to see how this functions in relation to expectations that are related to the term pornographic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think it could be discussed in more detail, but then mm -hmm. we would have to see the films and some scenes and uh, discuss the differences yeah. and so on. Yeah. yeah.
Well, we lead away. Uh, um, this this will lead back to the question of the, uh, the body in general, but maybe that will be the questions that we will have to discuss with with Lawrence after yeah. seeing the film. And since I'm seeing the watch, and we are supposed to be in the cinema quite soon, um, we wanted to keep this very short, just as a kind of teaser. And uh, we hope you have the chance now to come very. Uh, well, at eight o'clock to the screening hall, and we keep it here and hope you enjoyed this uh, as a kind of warm-up. Warm-up. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.